Uh, follow away, Houston. Go ahead. Uh, Roger, entry interface minus four hours is uh, just about right for the VHF. That's about uh, all around 142 GET. Roger, thank you. Next voice. Next voice you hear will be that of the smiling Irishman. Outstanding. Follow oh, 8, Houston North. Go ahead. Yeah, good morning, James. Oh, it's Michael McConnell's visit. Good morning for you. Righto, and we're looking at your uh, pitch uh, CDU readout down here, and it looks just like you're about 25 degrees off the uh, the 180 for your PTC, and we were just wondering how come. Well, we've been looking at that too. Uh, it keeps wandering off in pitch for some reason more than y'all. I was just about ready to go back to it again. I uh, had to go back one time, and I'm just seeing how far she's drifts. I thought it was a lot of ways to come back by itself, but it's not doing it. Oh, okay. We'll get back there. This is the uh, black team's uh, final change of shift briefing. And uh, from my left, uh, let me introduce uh, our participants today. On my immediate left, uh, Glenn Lunny, flight director of the black team. Jerry Bostic, uh, retro fire officer for the black team. Major General Vincent Houston, DOD manager of manned space flight support operations and uh, Mr. Jerry Hammock, uh, Chief of the uh, Landing and Recovery Division at Manned Spacecraft Center. Uh, we'll open uh, with uh, Glenn Lunny. Uh, very briefly, what we'll do here for you this evening is uh, uh, briefly review the work that we had to do today, which was really not very heavy. Jerry Hammock uh, will talk about uh, some of the aspects of the entry and the recovery posture. General Houston will be glad to answer any questions you have uh, in the recovery or support area. And Jerry Bostic has been working out a lot of the numbers for retrofire and entry, and I know a lot of people are always interested in getting exact times, etc. so we'll try to help you out there. Very briefly, uh, we, we came on duty at about 119 hours. We were at an altitude above the Earth of about 126,000 miles. We had, over the whole day, a generally quiet day, primarily of uh, passive thermal control and uh, P-23, that is the navigation program work. Uh, at 120 hours, we moved into the program 23, the navigation work off the stars. Uh, at about that time, also, you heard some discussion about loss of a transducer in the primary radiator loop. We lost the rad out temp. Uh, that's no problem. There are plenty of other uh, measurement points in the loop and we're satisfied that the loop is working properly as has been demonstrated by its performance all day. Uh, during the uh, uh, navigation work we have been watching some quad, one quad in particular rather carefully. It's not that the quad is especially hot or especially near any uh, limit. It is just a hotter, quad A is slightly hotter than the other quads, so we are doing what we can to favor it so that the uh, overall balance of the spacecraft, the thermal balance of the spacecraft remains about even. Uh, Frank reported all good sleep uh, for all three crew members. They seem to be feeling real fine and very chipper, and uh, I think they've all got about seven hours their last time out. And uh, one or two of them are just getting settled down now for uh, another couple hours before the entry work tomorrow. Uh, 121 hours and a half, they chlorinated the water. Mid-course 6 was scheduled uh, for today for this shift at 122 hours elapsed. However, because of the uh, uh, current accuracy of the trajectory, uh, there was no need to do that. The maneuver was on the order of four-tenths of a foot per second today and we would not do any maneuver that small since that's essentially noise level in how well we know what uh, maneuver to perform. Uh, but, uh, by the way, the maneuver tomorrow, uh, mid-course 7, which occurs two hours prior to uh, entry, it will be on the order of uh, two feet per second. As you know, the exact number will continue to be refined during the course of the night as we get more tracking in, but it's a pretty small maneuver and will be that big. Even if we didn't make that maneuver, we would still be comfortably in the corridor. Uh, 
more navigation work, and more passive thermal control. And that went on for several hours. Uh, we started uh, charging a battery uh, and uh, charge battery B up so that essentially we have three almost uh, completely full up battery char uh, charged batteries. We have about 117 point something amp hours in the batteries out of the uh, potential 120 amp hours. Uh, at 128 hours elapsed, we had uh, a short TV show. It was preceded by a checkout, which uh, was also several minutes long. Uh, the TV pictures were primarily, were entirely of uh, the Earth. Uh, at that time, the altitude above the Earth was 96,000 miles, and the velocity was about 61 feet per second, 6,100 feet per second. Um, I understand that we are trying to make a sketch up of the picture that we got with uh, uh, sketches underneath, as you know, on weather maps with the continents, etc. And some uh, uh, people are doing that, and we hope to make that available sometime, perhaps towards the end of this press conference yeah, for let you. Me, let me insert it. Uh, let me insert at this point, Glenn. Uh, we do have a slide uh, made up by a gentleman here at the Manned Spacecraft Center, Dick Underwood. And uh, we propose to project it at the end of the news conference on this screen and have uh, Dick uh, go over some of the features that are shown. Okay, fine. Uh, that briefly summarizes the shift that you just heard. Uh, the next shift is, again, a fairly quiet one. Uh, there will be some more navigation work, and when we're not doing that, we'll be in the passive thermal control mode. Uh, we will be then, when we get all three crew members up, there'll be the final preparations. Mostly th these preparations are, by way of stone the cockpit, uh, final preparations for the entry. There'll be a mid-course, a small one, as we've already discussed, tomorrow morning, and then the final entry. Jerry, uh, Hammock, perhaps now, will uh, tell us about the entry. Well, uh, I prepared a few um, quick uh, charts over here to sort of set the stage and uh, we'll be glad to answer any questions that you have, but I was going to go over the... I have a mic here. Uh, I was going to go over uh, the sequence and what we would expect, and, and I'm going to cover later the times and the uh, logistics uh, of arrival of the uh, crew in the spacecraft. Uh, any questions uh, having to do with reentry, of course, would direct to Jerry Bostic. I'm just setting the stage here that after the command module spacecraft separation, we come on into entry, um, plus 15 minutes after that into entry at 400,000 feet and come on in for the landing. Uh, the details of that are shown here now as we get into the landing phase. This is the descent phase. At the uh, command module plus space plus uh, service module uh, separation, uh, Plus 23 minutes from that time, the apex cover is jettisoned, immediately followed by the drogues. The drogues um, are deployed at 24,000 feet. Slows the, uh, slow. we, we are counting here now from command module, service module separation, plus time from that. Plus, plus 23 minutes, 24 seconds. Then that, that's when the, apex, when the apex cover is jettisoned and the uh, drogue chutes are released to stabilize and slow the spacecraft down. Slows it to about 300, uh, 300 miles per hour, 300 uh, in that neighborhood. Roger, thank you, Frank. At uh, 10,000 feet or plus 24 minutes and 38 seconds, the drogues are released and the pilot chutes pull out the, th the uh, mains at 83-foot diameter ring sail uh, mains. Uh, this is at 10,000 feet. Now this gives you a descent velocity at the surface uh, around 31 feet per second, where we have landing 28 minutes and 46 seconds from uh, command module, service module separation. I'm going to go into more detailed times as far as local times in a minute. This is corresponds to four this corresponds here to 445 local in the recovery area as Houston, far as you, our eight. time here, 945 Houston, time, Houston, so you can count back from here. Like I'll PTC get into those times in just a minute. Now, one thing I'd like to, to uh, bring out is the, uh, is the 
landing attitude of the spacecraft and the possibility right, of the uh, stable tube condition that we had last time, and I think we ought to be prepared for that eventuality, as we've had it on the last two spacecraft, and we've got a pretty high probability, as far as the probability numbers are concerned, to going into a stable two attitude. However, the normal attitude is to come down in this condition right here. Uh, the harness aligns the spacecraft 27, at 27 degree angle to give you uh, a better penetration entry into the water to lessen the, uh, the uh, landing impact. Now, uh, at landing, the crew punches off the parachute, releases the parachute, and uh, uh, the uh, recovery retrieval proceeds. Follow it, Houston. Uh, however, if we uh, get pulled over by the parachute or wave into a stable fine. two mode, immediately upon okay, landing in a stable two mode, the command uh, pilot would uh, start the inflation sequence, pumping up three bags that are capable of uprighting the spacecraft and putting it into the stable one condition. Now this sequence, as far as how long it takes to do this, varies. Uh, it, it can be as low as around four and a half minutes, but it can be as much as 12 minutes. This crew, that, this particular crew here, uh, uh, Frank and Jim and Bill, uh, in our training out in the Gulf when they were out there, the trainer spacecraft took 12 minutes to upright. Now, when it's in this stable two condition, you understand the antennas are underwater so that you do not get any uh, electronic signals. So we should be prepared for that. It hangs about like this. Actually, it's in that relationship. We have the... Uh, the uh, Apollo 8, Houston, over. We have the... Uh, we have the uh, on this number four buckhead, we have the... Hey, the temperatures are looking antenna. good, Frank. There's still a so the differential temperature between quads, but... Right uh, here. So when it's in that in in a stable two about condition, about which is even further over than this shows with the bags, all of that, all the antennas are underwater, so we get no signals. So d depending upon what that time is, from four and a half to, well, say on the outside, 12 minutes, uh, we will get no signals. Now, if we start getting a, a signals immediately when, it, when it's in the water, we know it's in the uh, stable one attitude. What? Yes, the, the antenna. Yes. What position are the crew in when they're in stable two? They are upside down. Uh, over, you know, they, normally they are in here, as you know, in the couch, and so they are just over like that. Now, um, so this is a normal, and, and this is, uh, the probability of this is, is enough so that we don't consider it a very abnormal kind of a situation. We've designed for it. We have the, the uh, flotation bags to bring it up into stable one condition. Uh, it only takes two of the bags, in fact, to bring it up into uh, stable one condition. You might be interested in knowing the location aids that we have aboard the spacecraft. We have the what, we, what you just referred to as the recovery beacon. This is a VHF beacon that operates at 243 megacycles. We have the VHF voice. Then we have a survival radio in case we need that. This would be in case... Uh, you did a stable two egress if that was required, and you'd have uh, you'd have that radio in your three-man life raft. The ranges of this equipment are up to 195 nautical miles, depending upon the altitude of the search aircraft. Then we have the flashing light, which will be turned on uh, at main chute. And by the way, these are actuated. Uh, the VHF recovery beacon is activated actuated at uh, main chute. The flashing light has two rates, one 120 flashes per minute and one 15 flashes per minute. Then as far as the augment the visual, uh, visual cues, we have the C-dye marker, which is a yellow-green color. 120 if you're in the vicinity of the recovery forces, which we expect. It, uh, the 15 rate would be in a contingency kind of a thing to conserve battery power. Jim Shannon, do you have a about eight miles? So it's a white, white light. Strobe light, yes. What is this? Your range when you run out of battery power at a one twenty and at fifteen. Say that again. How long will it flash at one twenty and how long will it flash at fifteen? How long, when it runs out of battery power? Well, it, you don't. It uh, won't flash anymore when you give. 
does it take to run out of battery? Uh, it's, is it 12, Jim? Well, it's running out the spacecraft batteries, so it could last uh, 10 or 12 hours. It, it'd be just a matter of how long your batteries in your spacecraft would last. Yes, but I think he's asking something different. On the water, we would have capability to stretch the batteries up to 24 hours or so with a normal entry. Yeah, that's the least of the power requirements. And then it has to do, too, with the amount of battery power that's left. At that point, we should have a hack on that from the flight control people. Okay, so much for the recovery aids. Uh, uh, this is a uh, really sort of a duplication of what you've seen in the uh, press kit with a little bit of updating. I don't know whether you can see it out there, but it's a uh, our terminal area landing ellipse, which is roughly 800 by 300. And we have the uh, carrier position uh, at the in the mission aim point. Uh, Downrange, in case we had a uh, weather avoidance problem, we have position as an ex an, another ship, a secondary ship that has a re re recovery capability. And then we have an array of three C-130 aircraft that cover the whole area with the direction finding equipment to DFN on the beacons that I was describing earlier. Um, right now, the in the mission target point that I'm carrying, Jerry Bostic might can update this, is 8 degrees, 8 minutes north by 165 degrees west. Is that correct now, Jerry? Uh, our landing time that we are carrying as of right now, as I said earlier, is 4.45 a.m. local time, that is local in the recovery area, which corresponds to 9.45 a.m. here. Now, as you know, we've stated that this is a... Uh, nighttime landing. Um, I put on here for your reference the time of sunup in the area, 6, 10 a.m. local. However, you start getting some light, what the Almanac called this civil twilight at 547. So you see we have roughly about an hour of darkness, although General Houston informs me that they ran a simulation out there this morning and they started getting <coughs> effective light about 15 minutes earlier than that. So we'll have about a 45-minute period of darkness. Now, uh, the situation, that, the guidelines that we've adopted, and uh, uh, General Houston has passed this out to the operational forces, is we will not drop swimmers until light. Um, and I think we ought to stress this point uh, here. I'll let you know our plans. Uh, if the spacecraft is in good condition, the crew is in good condition, and the weather isn't worsening, we can see no reason to drop <coughs> swimmers at night. So, and we're in contact. And, we're in contact. and we're in good, good calm. In other words, everything in a stabilized condition, we're not worried about anything. If we're worried about anything, or if the crew tells us, says that he'd like to have the swimmers down there, or if the weather's worsening, then the on-scene commander uh, has authority to go ahead and drop the swimmers. But right now, we expect not to do that. Why would you not drop swimmers at night? Is there some it, particular danger in that? Well. It's just easier to work in the daytime than it is at night. However, the swimmers have capability to do this. They have done this. These are very highly trained uh, UDT swimmers. Uh, General Houston, you might mention uh, the capabilities of these uh, UDT people. Well, we've, we've, uh, we've actually done it in the dark during the simulations in preparation for the mission. So it, it can be done. But NASA uh, assures us that the, the uh, spacecraft uh, Floats well. There's no reason to uh, to go charging off uh, preliminarily, and we've mutually agreed that in discretion indicates that if we have good communications with the astronauts, if their condition is good, if they the spacecraft is floating well, and they prefer to remain in the spacecraft, which has been discussed with the commander previous to the mission, why uh, we'll hold the swimmers into the air until they have adequate daylight to do the collaring job. And, uh, however, if any of these factors change, or if the crew decides they prefer to have swimmers in the water now, they will, they will win the water. As a matter of fact, the, uh, uh, one of the crewmen, Jim Lovell, participated in a 48-hour qualification test off a spacecraft in which he was out there in the Gulf for 48 hours, day and night. We were stationed keeping on him with a retriever, and we've pretty much proven that this is a, a good vessel. So it just doesn't seem to be any advantage to get them out uh, early if they don't need to be taken out. Yes, sir. That, that would be up to the evaluation of the crewman, how sick he, he personally is, and he'd have to call on that point. <laughs>
Yeah, if we have questions, can we w raise our hands and wait for the mic, please? Are the uh, recovery helicopters equipped with uh, lights similar to the ones they have in Vietnam? They have lights, and they will put them on, just as, a, as an added factor that if we have electronic fix problems, the crew may see the helicopters, you see, but so, they, and they may be in voice contact, so it's just an added factor in darkness that might work to our advantage if the weather is good enough. Uh, what will happen? Will the helicopters remain hovering with the spacecraft lit and the swimmers still in the choppers? Yes. And this will go on for an hour or so? 45 minutes 45 is our minutes. estimate based on this morning's exercise. 45 minutes is, is the estimate for what? It is the estimate from splash time to the point where the helicopter aircraft commander will feel that he has enough visual light before dawn, before official sunrise, in order to do the job uh, visually, you see. He is prepared, however, to go in before that point, if necessary, to uh, follow the space. So you don't expect a pickup or an opening of the, of the crew hatch until at least 5.30 local time? Yes, that, that, that is that our plan. Be. That is our plan now. Now, as I say, we're prepared to go in immediately to find the spacecraft. But uh, our plan is 5.30, yes. Uh, <clears throat> what is that uh, civil twilight read up there? I can't read it. Is it 5.07 or 5.47? The civil twilight, according to, to the nautical almanac, is 5.47. 5.47. But as, as General Houston just said, it seems that we got some effective light before that civil twilight, about 15 minutes earlier. Now, this is associated with the weather. We had clear, clear skies this morning, so you, you could see a few minutes earlier than if you had over. But that, that 45 minutes would be optimum, then. That would be the best you could do. Uh, I think that's optimum, yes. Could we get a weather update in the recovery zone? Well, you want me to? Why don't you go ahead? I think you might have gotten a later forecast. My, my weather briefing has been fairly consistent for the past 36 hours, and it is uh, 2,000 foot scattered, 12,000 foot broken, high overcast, 10 miles, 4 foot waves, and uh, 10 miles visibility. Good weather. Scattered showers. 10 knots. The landing point is in the uh, ITC area, in a, in a tropical zone of convergence that sort of hangs around in there. And these are typical, as General Houston says, this has been the forecast for the last 36 hours, fairly stable situation, but uh, adequate, certainly adequate recovery condition. Now, we will, want, we will run a, a weather recon 12 hours before splash time tonight, and we'll have on-scene uh, weather recon from the air, and of course we have the, the ship's uh, observations. Uh, General, in the previous uh, recoveries, there's been a data pickup from the from the carrier by means of the the aircraft and C-130 uh, balloon type pickup. Uh, can you tell us whether or not there will be, uh, or has there been in the past, still photo pictures from the photo pool picked up in that package of data? Well. We have that capability, and I, I seem to have overheard them talking about it. Now, I can't really answer your question specifically, but I, I have the impression at the moment they are planning. I think that's correct. They use this star system where they have a balloon released from the deck, and they fly over it with a C-130 aircraft and snatch it. And I believe that has been laid on for this I flight. I believe that's right. It can be done. I think it's been laid I was, uh, well, I have two questions. Uh, is it the first uh, recovery uh, during the darkness? Or? Follow the second question is, uh, what time do you well, estimate that the Apollo uh, We've been looking at these stars that we gave you this time for P-23. It looks like the second star, number 11, uh, has a trunnion well, angle right, right out near the limit, about 49.7 degrees. This is just an and we're thinking it might be a better idea to switch you over to that. star it's 1, like card, I think we should which has a much smaller trunnion angle. What do you think? Star 1 is Alpha Rathor. Four to six hours. Fly with me, uh, just six, six star yeah. one. Okay, that will be then in place That's of right. star 11, star, star, star one, and in place of five. lunar far horizon, I'm sorry, so lunar still near horizon, and it remains two sets. Over. Uh, 11 minutes before splash. Star one, lunar near horizon, uh, two sets. Thank you. Check my arithmetic. Splash should be at uh, 147. 
I got 28 minutes 46 seconds there, Jerry. Entry to landing, is that? That's, uh, that's right. 20, 28, 28 minutes that's right. 46 right. seconds is what I'm carrying on that. Uh, I wonder if you could the, tell us what the, the uh, we're, we're trajectory about, we're, is we're going about to be four, 400,000 feet. 40,000 feet? 400,000 feet. 400,000 feet is entry, and from entry to landing, I'm carrying 28 minutes, 46 seconds. From entry to landing? Right. That doesn't way it look, doesn't, not the way it looks. Way separation, it looks command here. module, service module, separation to entry is 15 minutes. I wonder if you could tell us the trajectory from 400K down we, and the G-forces involved. We have, uh, we've seen skip demonstrations, we've seen, and, and we understand they're wrong, and we've been told that the maximum G would be 6.8, we've been told the maximum G would be constant at 4, and can you, can you breeze through it very quickly to, to pin down these details for us? Okay, the, uh, with the current entry profile that we're plane to fly, the maximum G will be 6.8. Now that will, that peak, the first peak will occur about uh, 80 seconds uh, after entry interface, 400,000 feet. Then at about uh, 360 seconds after entry interface, they'll have another spike up to about 6 Gs. And the uh, if you're interested in the duration uh, of those spikes, the uh, first spike above uh, four Gs, the time spent above four Gs, is uh, about 40 seconds. And on the, the second spike, it's about 45 seconds above four Gs. Could we have a uh, schedule of the debriefing uh, situation? And John, what's the family situation as far as uh, uh, reunions are concerned? I don't have the uh, debriefing schedule for the flight crew. I'm sure Deke Slayton will I, have that I've got the morning. logistics of them coming back. Why don't I finish up this okay. and then go into the question? I was about through this chart. Uh, I wanted to point out, however, that we have tracking. We have a tracking station and two ships to update uh, the accuracy of this of this uh, landing point. We have the Guam station over here that covers uh, the entry and pre-entry area. We have the Redstone in the uh, pre-entry area. We have the, uh, the Redstone tracking ship. We have the Huntsville tracking ship that gets about one minute in blackout on the C-band beacon and about four minutes after. All of the, this information feeds in uh, that aids us in the, uh, in the uh, prediction of that landing point, which General Houston passes on out to the recovery forces. Uh, so I guess that pretty much takes care of this chart. Let me go to show you a little bit of the uh, logistics here, and that's my final chart. It touches on your question. The uh, crew will spend the night aboard the ship uh, and leave the next morning, Saturday the 28th at noon, Hawaii time, which is 4 o'clock local time, our time here. Uh, they'll, they'll fly off aboard uh, by cart aircraft, fixed-wing cart aircraft, into uh, Hickam. They'll arrive there at 2.30 p.m. and and uh, quickly get into an awaiting C-141. We've estimated uh, C-141 depart Hawaii at 3 p.m. Hawaii time, 7 o'clock our time, to arrive at Ellington, arrive at Houston or Ellington the next, early the next morning, the 29th, Sunday, at 4 a.m. So the uh, activity of the crew uh, after that, I'm not aware. Command module, in, uh, the command module will be offloaded in Hawaii at Fort Island on Sunday, December the 29th at uh, 8 a.m. Hawaii time. It'll depart Hawaii three days later. It takes 72 hours to deactivate the spacecraft. Departing there at 8 a.m. January the 1st, Wednesday, for arrival back in, Los Angeles, in Long Beach, actually, to, for transport to the Downey plant, uh, arriving there at 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Okay, that's, uh, that completes... Uh, that okay, why don't we open for questions uh, officially now. John Wilford. Uh, I had uh, a question in the transcript. It, you mentioned a point uh, where the uh, beyond which you, you could not land in the Atlantic or the Indian Oceans. Uh, before you reach that point, how would you have changed your trajectory to land in the Atlantic or the Indian Ocean? Would it have been an SPS burn or? Yes. 
SPS burn. That's right. I have uh, two questions. I thought Splash was scheduled for 147.0024 or thereabouts. Is that correct? That's right. Well, that doesn't work out 28 minutes from 400K. That's like 14 minutes. That's right. Where did you get the 28 number? I'm sorry, what? I say 14 is right from entry interface to landing. Right, uh, okay. The, the 28 that he was talking about is from separation, roughly, actually, it's close right. to I wonder 29. if it would be possible for us to get uh, those figures again on uh, the crew activities after recovery. If you could just run through the times, I would appreciate it. What's your time after recovery? Okay. Can you see that? Let me read it again. Um, do do these uh, two uh, these two uh, peaks of uh, G forces mean that you are using the uh, skip technique at reentry? Re That's true. It, well, <coughs> it, the entry will, will be under control of the guidance and navigation system on board the spacecraft. Uh, it is a skip but uh, not a skip out, of course. Yeah. I don't like the word skip, really. <laughs> Why is the fault constant for g That is the backup technique to refer to, the constant 4G backup, the manual crew backup. You've succeeded in confusing me entirely. <laughs> could we, uh, could, could you tell us what the diameter of the corridor is, if that hasn't changed along with everything else? That's a question I've never known how to answer, and I always get it like how, how high and how wide is the corridor in, in miles. And uh, the corridor, the, the way we can, uh, are concerned about it, is measured in degrees of flight path angle below the local horizontal. It's an angle. Now, the angle that we are shooting for is six and a half degrees below horizontal. Well, we've heard 30, 30 miles, and we've heard 26 miles, and uh, is there a mileage figure you can put on it that we can make things plain to the people that read the newspapers? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what measurement you're talking about. He's talking about vacuum perigee, Jerry. Oh, the yeah. vacuum perigee altitude? Yeah, the, the, the mouth of the corridor that you have to shoot this thing through to get it down without burning them up. half degrees to the horizontal. Isn't that basically what it is? Hey, you have to get it into that cone. When you get to 400,000 miles, you have to be at Jerry Bostick's angle of six and a half degrees below the horizontal, plus or minus about a degree, That's right. in order to be either remain captured or on the underside not pull more than 10 Gs. Okay, okay? but the plus or minus one degree would is translate... The measurement of, of how steep or how shallow the velocity vector is at 400,000 feet, which is defined as entry altitude. But the, the point is that at that point, the point you're aiming for, yes, plus or minus one degree, yes, would give a, a circle in space with a diameter of 30 nautical miles. Is that correct? Uh, it is about 30 nautical miles. I am not sure that's the exact number, though. Uh, for General Houston, is that whether you gave us the current weather or the forecast weather? Forecast weather. Do you have the current weather there now, sir? No, I don't, but it, it was uh, at least this good as the forecast. I'm yes, and I hope I remember it accurately, and I'm certain I am, but it was 2,000 feet scattered, 12,000 feet broken, high overcast, 10 miles visibility, 10 knots, 4 foot waves. Let's hold Scattered up the, showers. Let's hold up I, the mic, please. Uh, Harry Peace. I'd, I'd like to clarify this splash time, which has been given as 4.45 a.m. local. It has been given as uh, 1, uh, what is uh, 37, uh, 0024, uh, uh, for, or at any rate, the, uh, it, it would come out to be 51 minutes and 24 seconds local time instead of 45. 
and then we've got 14 minutes and 28 minutes involved. Could somebody square me away on this? I can. Uh, is this uh, is okay? I can tell you the uh, splice time is uh, is correct. It, it's really not very much different from um, the pre-flight planning time. I've been carrying this tattered sheet from the time we were planning this mission, and it shows here um, <laughs> uh, shows here. Uh, 454 local out there instead of 445. So it hadn't changed. It really hadn't changed very much. It's 445 local time in the area, which corresponds to 945 Central Standard Time. Now, the the uh, that's what I said. The uh, 454 was the was the earlier time. That's right. That was the time. Oh, as of say three weeks ago. Well, right now in real time. 940, that's right, 9, and... Okay, that, that means the mission is no longer 147 I haven't counted it up. I, uh, have you counted up? I guess that's it. That's right. There's a difference of, uh, of the uh, nine minutes. Could we... I, uh, I want to nail down this time between 400,000 feet and splashdown once and for all. Is it 14 minutes? Uh, 400 400,000 feet to landing entry to landing is 28 minutes 46 seconds. Is that what go, you had we, go no. we just we just no. had uh, <laughs> okay, your retro what, man what, say 14. I, I believe Jerry Bostic has got a sequence from uh, what entry interface on. Why don't we just run through that and it might turn out to be in ground elapsed time which I'm sure uh, all of our good people here can convert uh, very easily. Okay, you're right about being in ground last time. Unfortunately, the only thing I have in uh, in local time happens to be landing, and another unfortunate part about that is it doesn't agree with Jerry's number. <laughs> but I think that must be uh, a little old. The uh, the ground elapsed time of 400,000 feet is 146 hours, 46 minutes, and 13 seconds. GET for splash is 147 hours and 11 seconds. Why don't you give a what, is your, what is your real time for splashdown? You say it doesn't agree with his. Now why don't we hold Sorry, on the local second. time? Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, I'll give it to you in, in, in Greenwich Mean Time. It's, <laughs> it's 15, 51, 11. Then I think that works out to be 451.11 well, in the, in the local area. 451. That, that is yours. Now, now, which of you is right? Uh, you are. These numbers are right, yes. Okay. So, so, so in effect, it's uh, splashdown is 451 uh, local time, Hawaii time, right? That's right. You want to go through the intermediary numbers you have there, Jerry, and maybe this will just kind of hold off any further questions on the subject. Okay, the uh, ground elapsed time of initiation of blackout is 146. Apollo 8, Houston. Go ahead, Houston, Apollo 8. Roger, Frank. If you get a chance, we'd like you to read us down your trunnion calibration number. We missed that one on the downlink, and uh, we have an update for your passive thermal control attitude. Okay, the trunnion uh, calibration were all zeros. Roger, thank you. And uh, on page 2104, uh, we'll, the PTC attitude should read uh, zero pitch and 45 degrees yaw. Over. Zero pitch, 45 degrees, 2104. Roger, and we'd like some PRD readings for those of you that are up and around. Let us look. Zero pitch, 45 yards. Roger, thank you. I'm asking that no, and I didn't, wasn't sure I copied it right. Yeah, that's affirmative, Frank. Zero pitch, uh, 45 degrees, yeah. Okay, my uh, PRD now reads 2.85. 2.85. 
This is Apollo Control at 131 hours, 19 minutes. Our current spacecraft velocity at this time is 6,567 feet per second, and we're at an altitude of 85,284 nautical miles. Uh, since our previous report, it's been very quiet here in Mission Control Center. Uh, most of the activity has involved uh, checking, double-checking figures, and uh, uh, beginning preparation uh, to pass up the information to the crew that they will need for their final mid-course correction uh, two hours prior to entry. Uh, we've had uh, one or two very brief conversations with the spacecraft, and we'll pick those up and then stand by for any uh, live conversation that develops. Apollo 8 uh, Houston, radio check, over. Hey, you're loud and clear, Jim. I would like to get your PRD reading while we got you up, and uh, a flight plan change uh, we're suggesting on page 2-107 when you're ready to copy. Roger, Apollo 8. This is Houston, over. Roger, Mike. Are you still planning to send up these updates uh, at 132 hours? That's affirmative, uh, Jim. We're getting them together now. Roger. Apollo 8, this is Houston. Would you please go to Pooh and accept Jim, and we'll send you a, a P-27? Sending up the state vector to the LEM slot. This is Apollo Control Houston at 132 hours 9 minutes. Apollo 8 is at an altitude of one, or rather 82,111 nautical miles. And our current velocity is 6,712 feet per second. It continues to be uh, very quiet here in uh, Mission Control and aboard the spacecraft. We've uh, had one or two very brief conversations with the crew, and we're anticipating a call up to the spacecraft shortly from Mike Collins, so we'll pick that up and, uh, and then stay tuned. Call 8, this is Houston, over. Go ahead, Houston. Roger, Jim, you can go back to block. We got P-27 in and verified. It was a state vector update to the LEM slot. And I'm standing by for the mid-course correction number seven and the uh, entry pad at your convenience. Over. Roger, stand by. Go ahead with uh, mid-course number seven. Okay, mid-course correction number seven. RCS slash GNN. Three, 
one six zero zero not applicable not applicable one four 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 five five seven niner niner minus zero 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 one four plus five zeros plus zero 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 one are you with me so far over roger with you good zero 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 three zero four zero 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 not applicable zero 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 one niner one zero 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 one four zero zero four zero 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 one four four five zero hey Mike, hold it, hold it, Mike. okay holding uh, you said uh, not applicable for AJ and HP, I started to copy it down, and then I didn't get the right number sequence. Did you skip down to what, BG? No, uh, let's go back to uh, Apogee is not applicable, and uh, then I just started reading the numbers again from there. I've got a Perigee, and then a Delta VT, and then a burn time, and so forth. Over. Okay, I didn't hear a plus or minus on the HP, and I only got four numbers off of it. So could you start with the HP again? Okay, uh, going back to uh, Apogee, not applicable. Perigee, plus zero, zero, one, niner, one. And uh, you weren't hearing things. It was my mistake, over. Roger. Okay, picking up with Delta VT. Zero, 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 one, four. Zero, zero, four. Zero, 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 one, four. Four, five. Zero. Four, five, niner, two, two, five, Shala, up, two, three, six, zero, 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 plus. Zero, eight, one, three, minus one, six, five, zero, three, one, two, two, zero, two, three, six, three, zero, one. One, four, six, four, six, four, one. North set of stars, Sirius and Rigel. Roll three, zero, eight. Pitch two, zero, niner. Yaw three, five, seven. Remarks. Perigee in P30 equals plus 22.2 nautical miles. Over. Roger. Mid course number 7.
That's all correct, Jim, and I have the entry pad at your convenience. Mike, 
Okay. That's all correct. We certainly don't waste much time getting down the drone deploy, do we? Roger, that's uh, that's true. Follow eight, Houston or Go ahead, Houston. Roger, Jim, uh on your computer. We'd like to do an erasable memory dump uh, again like we did the other day. And the reason we'd like to do it is uh, when you did uh, P-37 about eight hours ago, and uh, you remember you put that EI time in for TIG uh, and, and got that PUDU thing, we'd like to, uh, we, we don't think there's anything in the world wrong with it. We think everything is, is just perfect inside the computer, but we'd like to do an erasable dump and as we did the other day, go through it bit by bit, give us something to do down here, over. And I have the uh, procedure for you when you're ready to copy. Go ahead. Okay, verb, O-1, noun, O-1, enter. Three, 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 enter. And then read out register one, and that register one should be 10,000, one, zero, 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 zero. And uh, then if it's not, I can give you a procedure for, for getting it to 10,000. If it is 10,000, as we expect, then uh, verb 74, enter. And that'll do the dump. Over. Roger, what do you want? Uh, Houston, uh, And Apollo 8, you can do the, the first part of that. Now it's your convenience to verify that register 1 is reading 10,000, but would you hold up on uh, the dump itself until we get our ground stations configured, please, over. This is Apollo Control at 132 hours, 38 minutes. At the present time, uh, we're in touch with the spacecraft. Uh, we'll pick up that conversation for you and then stand by to follow it as it uh, develops. Roger, 